Hello everyone, this is part 2 of the overview for the M5 forecasting competition. In the last video, we went through the hierarchy of time series we'd be forecasting for. If you haven't watched that, I'll link it right here. Now that we've understand exactly which series we're going to be predicting for, let's take a look at what data is provided to us and how we'll be evaluated. The first file called calendar.csv contains information describing the date when a product is sold. This includes day of the week, month, year, and whether or not there is an event such as a holiday. These are going to help us because it's very likely that lots of products sell more on weekends, or some products are going to sell more around the holiday, for example, Turkey around Thanksgiving. So if our model learns this pattern, it's going to apply it to future forecasts. The last three features in this file, SnapCA, SnapTX, and SnapWI, are binary values indicating whether or not SNAP purchases are allowed on this day in this state. SNAP stands for Supplement Nutrition Assistance Program, which helps low-income families purchase food products. The monetary benefits are only dispersed on certain dates, and these binary features basically encodes which date SNAP purchases are allowed. For example, if the value of SNAP CA is 1 on a certain day, we can expect sales for certain food products in California to increase because of SNAP purchases. The second file called Sale Prices contains information about the price for a product store date combination. As a consumer, we know that a product price often fluctuates. Sometimes it's due to inflation, especially because the historical data provided to us spans over five years. We can expect some product prices to gradually increase. Sometimes it can be due to weekly promotions, which might have a significant impact on sales units. Promotion planning usually happens a couple weeks prior, so if we're making forecasts for the next 28 days where we know there's going to be promotions, and hence price drops, we should forecast for more sales units. The third file, called salestrain.csv, contains the actual historical unit sales per product store combination. I'll open a Jupyter notebook and use the pandas library to take a look at this file. This file is fairly straightforward, where each data point specifies its item ID, department ID, category, store ID, state and daily sales from day 1, January 29th of 2011, to day 1941, which is June 19th of 2016. As mentioned in the last video, since we're in the validation phase, this file is currently called salestrainvalidation.csv, and we can only see 1913 historical sales data with the last 28 days hidden from us. There is one extra file called samplesubmission.csv, which is an example of what our submission file should look like. Each value ID is a concatenation of item ID and store ID, and either end with validation or evaluation. Notice that this file is exactly twice as long as the sales train validation.csv, and that's because in the file we submit, we want to first make predictions for each of these 30,490 series for the next 28 days. And we'll enter these forecasts in all the validation entries. Then we want to make forecasts for another 28 days right after, with day numbers 1942 to 1969. When forecasting for validation points, we're essentially making forecasts for 28 days between days 1914 and 1941. Forecasts for these evaluation points are made for 28 days between 1942 and 1969. The next section explains the evaluation metric with quite a lot of details. When we run tests locally, we want to write this into code so we can evaluate performance the same way we'll be evaluated on Kaggle. Optimizing with a different metric can give us very different models, and we don't want that. The metric that we're instructed to use to evaluate loss for each series is called root mean squared scaled error, shorted as RMSSE. It's calculated as the following. The numerator is calculated by the sum of squared differences between the actual sales value and the forecasted value for each of the 28 days. We're instructed to use a variation of squared error instead of absolute error because absolute loss functions optimize for the medium. I found a very interesting and intuitive explanation of why that is, and I'll link it down in the description below. The denominator is given by the mean square differences between consecutive days starting from day 2 to the last day of the training set. 
which in our validation phase is day 1913. This acts as a normalizer. My understanding of how this works is that by taking the average squared differences between consecutive days, we get to encode the range of values the series fluctuate around its mean. So using this as a denominator standardized comparison between series of different scales. An example I'm thinking of right now is that say we want to predict Tesla stock prices. Series A is historical prices in units of dollars and series B is historical prices in units of cents. We build model X on series A and model Y on series B. The denominator in this formula for series B is going to be 10,000 times larger than series A. So if predictions from X and Y are exactly the same after a unit change, these two models will end up with the same RMS's E score. As a disclaimer though, I'm not a qualified theorist to explain this, so if you think otherwise, please leave a comment below. The RMSS E is used to score individual series, and our submission will be ranked using a weighted aggregation of these individual scores. This score is called the weighted RMSS E, short as WRMSS E, which just adds up the product of RMSS E for each series with its respective weight. A lower WRMSS E gives us a higher ranking. This next section is about evaluation for the uncertainty competition, so we don't have to learn about that. Then it goes on to explain how weighting works. Essentially, series containing products with higher business values, for example, more expensive products or products that sell in larger quantities, have a higher weight. With this in mind, the weight will be based off of the cumulative dollar sales using the last 28 days of the training example. There's an example given in this document that goes through how weight is calculated in a very simplistic setup. In this setup, we have only two levels in the hierarchy. And we assume there are only three series, two of them being units sold in one specific store in Wisconsin of product A and B respectively. Let's call this SA and SB. In the last series, their aggregated sales. Let's call this SAB. First, we want the weight for each level in the hierarchy to sum to one. So the weight for SA is given by dollar sales of A divided by total dollar sales in that level, which is dollar sales of A plus dollar sales of B. The same logic applies to series SB. Then because SAB is the only series in its hierarchy, we'll give it a weight of 1 for now. Then we want to make sure the sum of weights over all the hierarchies is 1. So we divide everything by the number of hierarchies denoted by this 1 over k in front of every weight. Therefore, the final effective weight for each series is dollar sales of this series divided by the sum of dollar sales of all series in this hierarchy, then divided by the total number of hierarchies. I'm going to end this video right here. We now have an understanding of our objectives, data provided, and evaluation metric. In the next video, we're going to work on combining these data into a single data frame and visualize some trends. Please subscribe and stay tuned.